Um, welcome everybody to our May Lunch and Learn. Um, I wanted to let you know about a couple of changes. Uh, because we have started with more people showing up for the Lunch and Learns, we tried to make a couple of changes just so that things operate a little more smoothly and so there's a good flow because we've also been recording them recently and um, we wanna be mindful of the people who are watching the video. Um, one of the things is you'll notice that when you came in, you were muted this time, normally you're not, but um, we did that because we do have some people who do come in after the Lunch and Learn starts. And this way, if they come in, they don't bring background noise with them while we have somebody presenting. Um, but always feel free to unmute during that time because it's a great time to kind of chat and hear about my dogs. Um, also, we are going to ask, if possible, that you submit your questions via chat. Um, and then either Esmeralda or I will uh, at, try to grab those and, and present those to, um, to the group or to specific presenters for answers. Um, but we're hoping that that's gonna help with the flow a little bit more also. Okay, so it's, it seems appropriate um, since we we're talking about stable housing during a pandemic that um, we start with a prayer. Um, and this is the prayer during difficult economic times. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that. Gracious God, we know that your love is infinite and that you care about all areas of our life. In this time of economic insecurity, help us to trust that all of our security is in you. Keep us mindful that you always have and always will provide for our needs. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Merciful God, we ask that you give our leaders the wisdom to guide our nation and the world out of the current economic crisis. Help us to protect the poor and all those who are struggling during this difficult time. Provide for their needs and give them hope. Open new opportunities for them and furnish the resources they need to live with dignity. Encourage those who have enough to share essential resources with those who lack the necessities of life and to do so with humble, grateful, and loving hearts. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. So we know that housing has an impact on pretty much every aspect of our lives. Um, there's lots of research out there, but I think just anecdotally we know this. Um, if you have a challenging day out in the world, you love to come home. You love to come back to your space. It's safe, it's comfortable. Your things are there. The people that you know might be there. Um, it's where we keep important things, important documents, medications. It's where we hang up clothes that we might need for a job interview or to go to mass. Um, it's, it's just so important all around. Um, and so it's especially ch challenging to hear that right now, so many people are on the brink of losing their homes. Oh, I froze up, I'm hoping I'm back. Um, whether they uh, rent or own, um, there, there are challenges for both groups. Um, so today we're very fortunate we have Lisa Nafziger, Nafziger, I hope I got your last name right, Lisa, um, who's going to talk with us from Community Action of Southeast Iowa. Um, and she's gonna share with us um, a little bit about the work that they do, about um, any changes that they've seen, you know, and during the pandemic that are different than what they might've normally seen. And maybe even some of the things that they were expecting to be different, but weren't. Um, and then the resources that are available out there to help people. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Lisa. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I work at a cubicle, so people often stop by, even though I have a big sign on my cubicle that says it's currently on a conference call. It's hard to see that apparently, so forgive me if we'll get in multiple interruptions. I should turn my phone off right now. Um, so as uh, Amy introduced, I work for Community Action of Southeast Iowa, and we are a government-funded agency that funnels government funds through our agency into the hands of low-income families. We work in the uh, 
uh, very southeast corner of Iowa. So my counties are Louisa, Des Moines, Henry, um, and Lee County. But Lee County, I, I'm a Lee County resident, and we call it the Florida of Iowa because we stick down into Missouri a little bit. But there is a divided line in Lee County, and we, we still refer to Lee County as the north and the south. <laughs> Don't know why, but that's just the way it's always been. And so I have centers in both um, Fort Madison and Keokuk. We have uh, neighborhood centers that um, people can call, um, used to be able to come into, but because of the COVID, um, we are now, uh, we have locked doors for the most part and see our, talk to our clients and assist our clients over the telephone, sometimes through email, sometimes through mobile chats like this, um, whatever tools it takes necessary to, to be able to help them. But the biggest reason or the one of some of the biggest work that we do is helping with rent utilities and then we have food pantries um, <clears throat> every year as a part of our grant our recipients we have to report every dollar that we receive from the the state and the feds um, has to be logged and recorded and sent back on a report at the end of the year to show that we use those funds as appropriate as possible and that we we do what we say we're going to do. So it's it's very heavily tracked and it's very heavily monitored and it's um, something that Community Action has been doing since the 1970s. So it's a great agency and it's a great thing. And I'll tell you that in my 50 years of 53 years of living, um, I came to Community Action just a couple of years ago and have been in the healthcare field for almost all of my um, professional career and had no idea that community action, I, I mean, I knew who they were and I kind of knew what a little bit about what they did, but I had no idea what an impact this agency and agencies like ours make on, a, on every community around the state of Iowa. Every state does the work that we do just a little bit differently. So the rules and the things that apply with Iowa don't necessarily bleed over into Illinois or down into Missouri in the exact same, in, in the exact same way. There are community actions in different states, but again, it just depends on our federal um, administration is, or state administration as to how those funds are operated. So we have a challenge, an extra challenge, just because people that live 10 miles from our Burlington Center could be Illinois residents. And it's really hard to justify our dollars on Illinois residents, but we're significantly closer than it might be for them to drive 30 miles to another bigger town. So we, we face those obstacles as best as we can, but typically we strictly are allowed to operate in Iowa with the four county trade area. Every year, well, our, our agency, um, has several divisions. So I don't know how familiar you are with Community Action, but we have like a weatherization program. So we help seniors and low income families keep their houses, uh, make their houses a little bit more suitable to keep out the elements of storms and snow and rain. Uh, we have a little bit of money for that. We work with, um, we have WIC, which is a women, infant, children. So we, we have um, those programs that we help new moms, nursing moms and pregnant mothers families it's excuse me not just moms um and we have head start and her early head start um my programs are the csbg which do the rent utilities um, food pantries and help families of low income um, navigate life in better ways we also have a program we call fads which is families um People who are on the old-fashioned welfare um, have an opportunity to work or be assigned to a case manager, and those case managers on my team work with them to set goals and help them improve the ways of their life so they can become self-sufficient and operate on their own and independently. Um, currently, we have about 70 families in the FADS team that we work with, and there's only five of our specialists that handle those 70 families. Um, <clears throat> we also have a parents as teachers program, which is not as popular, not as um, prevalent and talked about as much, but very similar working with low uh, families with small children and, and low income, um, helping them get their children ready for school and daycare and helping them just become independent. It, it just depends on the categorization and how the family presents to us as to how we might put them into the agency and which dollars we can spend on them based upon each individual application and information that we receive. There might be some other community action programs I'm not thinking of, but I know we're mainly here to talk about housing and that's the biggest program that we operate with. Um, every year we as an agency 
send out surveys to all of our clients to find out what's going on. What do you need? What, what are we not able to help you with? Where are you getting doors shut in your face? What do you, what, what can we help you with the most? And housing is always in the top five. Um, way before COVID, housing was still in the top five. And I feel like COVID has been going on for a hundred years and I know it's only been a little over a year, but it feels like it's been a, a, a tough long haul for us all. Uh, our clients, almost 40% of them tell us housing is an issue. So low income families, um, still suffer from housing issues and still need assistance. Um, a lot of them don't know what state assistance or federal assistance they might have, might qualify for when it comes to housing. So we help navigate those applications and those processes for them. Um, a lot of them just can't pay the rent. Um, you know, if you're working in minimum wage position at $8 and something an hour, it's hard to pay $750 a month rent as well as the utilities and things that go along with that. So we try to get them into the federal and state programs to help them help their dollars stretch and help them uh, be a success with, with how they're working. Um, let's see, you have a ton of facts and I don't wanna throw a ton of things at you, but we also work, one of the biggest things that we do is help people um, who are presenting as homeless. I'll admit that I had no idea um, homelessness was such a big deal in Southeast Iowa. I thought we were protected and I've lived here my whole life. Um, there are people that it, the, the state doesn't always make it easy for us to use our dollars on homelessness because there's there's specific I'm trying to say I'm trying to be politically correct. There's specific um, categories in which people fall. If you are a couch surfer and you can find a warm couch to sleep on with a friend or a family member or an acquaintance, you are not considered homeless in the state of Iowa, according to the, the definition of some of our program money. To me, that's completely wrong. Um, I understand that we can't help everybody that shows up at the door. We can't throw money in every direction. But to me, a family or children that are couch surfing are homeless and that we should make them a high priority and we just can't right now. But we're working on that with our legislators all the time. The biggest ways that our agency helps with um, had the housing issues as our clients tell us they need would be emergency rent assistance. When the COVID first hit, as you can imagine, so many businesses cut back, so many restaurants and service industries closed or shut their capacity at, at a level where so many people were laid off. Um, none of the unemployment benefits came right into effect immediately to help these people because the state didn't really know what we were up against. They didn't have that, that crystal ball to look forward and see what was going to happen. So people were able to reach out to us, fill out an application, tell us their story, and we were able to help right away with some rental assistance to keep some people housed during this unknown time. Same with utility assistance. We have special situations where somebody might need um, well, in Burlington, for instance, the water company bills on a quarterly basis. So a, a family with one toilet in their house, um, if you're based upon not usage, but how many toilets you have in your house, a one restroom, one toilet house is almost $270 a quarter for water. And you can't pay it monthly. You have to pay it quarterly. It's my understanding. I don't live in Burlington, but um, that's a big that's a big bill for somebody who is low income and has trouble stretching their dollars. And we see a lot of water assistance, and they, that is a huge utility need. I mean, I was thinking this morning as I was standing in the shower, my life would not be what it is today if I couldn't take a hot shower in the morning. And so that's a huge priority for our families. Um, we pay a lot of we pay a lot of utilities, but um, water to me is right up there with electricity. I mean, they're all just so important. We have different grants that have different rules and different definitions of which we have to follow, but you might hear um, us talking about or the government talking about ESG, which is an es emergency solutions grant, which helps with housing. But it's one of those. Well, and the, first of all, let me tell you that the government uses acronyms for everything, which I hate because I cannot figure them all out and they change them and they'll throw another little letter in there. So one year it'll be ESG, the next year it'll be ESGB, but it's the same program. They just added another word onto it. So I try not to use acronyms. But you will see them in the in the press releases and the things the state puts out, which um, 
bother me because I can't keep them straight and I'm supposed to talk about them all the time. But um, so ESGD, ESG, and then there's another one called TBRA, which is tenant based rental assistance. Those are dollars that we receive from the state and the federal government that have very strict, no questions asked guidelines. If you fill out an application and not every box can be checked and every line can be filled out completely, these people don't qualify. We can't use that money. So that money is money that we have that um, other agencies know that we have, but it's really hard for us to access the news because they've made this, the guidelines so stringent that it's been a very, very challenging program, but we've had it for years. It's just, they make it tougher every year to use it. Luckily with the COVID, we are given um, funds through the CARES Act that is a little bit more liberal, a little bit um, easier to use and easier to access. We are a nonprofit agency and we are so lucky to have partnerships with churches and families and groups um, that give us local support. So we get checks um, on a regular basis, sometimes monthly, sometimes quarterly from the same, you know, whether churches get together and decide they will pool X amount of dollars towards food pantries and X amount of dollars towards utilities. That local support is one of the ways that helps us to be able to help anybody and everybody that comes to the door with the blessing of the donor. So if the donor tells us how to use it, it's a little bit easier to use those funds and get the money right out into people's hands or not in their hands. We pay the vendors directly, but it helps us um, keep them housed and have their electricity on and food and their refrigerators because the, our, our donors are so generous. We talked a little bit about senior home repair and weatherization and <clears throat> I receive um, letters and cards and phone calls and got one yesterday. We were able to help a family um, with some local funds, um, a Lee County resident, North Lee County resident, whose husband has stage five terminal cancer. The water heater went out. They've got a grandchild staying with them um, not a planned stay. Water heater went out and as you can imagine, huge, huge um, obstacle in their lives trying to maintain dad's last few months on earth. Um, we were able to get a water heater put into that house from the time we got the application to the time the water heater was in was less than 12 hours. We have great partners in the community that understand our, our clients' needs and um, those kind of things are so impactful to me and it really justifies in my, when I get so burned out and so tired, it, it, it gives me spirit lift because I see and I feel and I understand the impact that we have. And we also are able to use some of our funds to replace furnaces and repair them in um, the senior citizens and some just low income families homes as the um, seasons change. Um, you know, furnaces just don't last 50 years anymore. And, and, and it's a really, and there's a lot of old 50 year old furnaces or 30 year old furnaces that we see for sure. Um, so we are able to use some of those programs and we can kind of partner together with um, their weatherization team and some of our other programs because they cost way more than they used to as well. And the, and the limits that we have on some of the programs won't pay for it all. So I could partner some of my funds with the weatherization team funds and we can make this happen for, for the clients as, as uh, they are approved and go through. One of the biggest um, programs that you that the, were just ended, um, let me think April 30th was the last thing. This is an acronym that, another one that we shouldn't use, we do, it's called LIHEAP. So <clears throat> low income, Home Energy Assistance Program is a program where all the utility company, well, I should say all, most of the utility companies in our region pool money together, put it in a fund, um, they give back some of their profits and put it in a fund and then share it with community actions to take applications to help low income families pay their bills. Sometimes it's a match program. So if the client has paid $400 this season, we can pay $400 and match it. Sometimes it's a specific, how many people are in your household, what income you report, and you qualify for one of three levels of assistance. I think the most popular um, 
award this year was $560, which goes a long way in a home that's fairly um, tight with good windows and, and a good roof to help stretch and keep the furnaces on during the winter. But we figure um, with our reporting in 2020, Community Action of Southeast Iowa put almost four and a half million dollars into housing assistance through our agency. So our 140 employees are busy, 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 busy working with clients and making these things happen. The biggest thing, um, the biggest housing program right now is the Iowa Finance Authority has, I don't even know, it started out with three and a half million dollars and I think it's sky's the limit at this point. I don't know where the money comes from, but I think that they have, um, a huge budget to help people who are affected by the COVID in some way, shape or form that can show a hardship um, or a job loss or exorbitant amount of bills due to being sick and in the hospital to apply for up to 12 months of rent and utility and water assistance. Um, <clears throat> there, <laughs> when my, my boss came to me, we were discussing um, how we were going to talk today about this program. I said, I, I, need, I need your motivation because I, this program boggles my mind and it, it was rolled out kind of before the government was really ready to start paying funds. So we just signed on in the last five days, I think, to start helping them process applications. Some of the uh, citizens of Iowa have applied as long as 45 days ago and nobody's looked at their applications yet. So they got a little ahead of their game by taking applications before the program was really ready. Um, I helped them on their last round of program assistance. And I think I alone processed 900 applications and were able to help a lot of people around the state of Iowa. This one, I can't figure it out. I've taken numerous classes. It's very complex. Um, there's about five of us here at the agency that are taking the training and discussing the ins and outs of the program, but it's brand new to us. Um, so you may hear or may see in the news that there are almost 11,000 applications around the state of Iowa. We believe our area here in Southeast Iowa probably only, I think we have maybe 1,200 of those in our region, um, but they're brand new and we haven't been able to approve anybody yet just because we haven't navigated the system fully yet and can't do it. Um, morally and ethically until we understand it. So we are still working on, on training and, and uh, we'll work through that as quickly as we can to help people. We are hoping that the governor extends the moratorium on eviction. Um, we are hoping that uh, the utility companies will extend their disconnect notices. We are hoping until we can all get our ducks in a row, we're hoping that uh, we can make an impact the way that this program was you know, set out by the feds to um, do the saving things it needs to do. But I'm just embarrassed to tell you I'm not ready because I can't figure it out, <laughs> but I'm working on it and I will, I will keep doing it. But we, uh, that's the big program right now. We're really trying to refer everybody to the IFA program, the Iowa Finance Authority program, because there is so much money there. And 12 months of assistance is more than anybody's, any agency like ours um, will be able to ever spend on anybody. So that's the best place for ever, all the clients to start. And um, the good thing about that program is if it is somebody who is not computer literate or is not comfortable filling out an application, the Iowa Finance Authority has uh, partnered with Iowa Workforce Development and clients and landlords can go <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but um, so that's a great thing because last time a lot of people missed out because they didn't have a computer or couldn't figure out the application. So I think that they've done a great job this time making sure that people weren't left out just because of um, their inability to have a computer or use a computer or navigate the application process. Because when you work with government, it's just not, it's not the way that you and I talk or we all talk to each other. It's different terminology and different, different ways they view things. Really what I have for you today, unless you have a, some questions or something I can help you with. We've had a couple of questions come in, Lisa. And okay. um, Linda, um, 
Linda Molyneux is also going to speak with us a little bit today, um, specifically about evictions. So um, I want to make sure we leave some time for Linda, but we'll go ahead and do these questions for right now with you, Lisa, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. So um, one of the questions is, the housing market right now is crazy, to say the least. There are more buyers than sellers, and houses are flying off the market within days. Because of the competition, buyers have to offer more than asking price. One realtor suggested 20,000 over asking. I guess we do have a chance at yeah. home. Um, how might this current situation affect affordable housing in our area and what are the ripple effects? I think that um, I'm a landlord. I was a landlord before I started working with Community Action. Um, I don't have a ton of properties, I just have a couple. and. I don't think it's going to do anybody any favors as far as tenants go. Um, I, as a landlord, I'm not getting rich by it. It's not something, um, I, it's not a win-win situation for anybody other than the seller of the homes and probably the realtors. The ripple effects, I think, are tremendous. I mean, I think it's so hard for me to be, to be politically correct at times, but I think the lenders will benefit more than the homeowners. I think um, we all as a nation will pay for decisions that are made today for generations to come. I, I don't know how we can solve any of it or fix any of it because we can't just stop buying houses and having a place to live. We can't stop providing rentals because it's better to sell it than keep it and rent it out. I wish I knew the answers. Okay, thanks. Um, also asked, um, what assistance um, is available for immigrant families with a mix of statuses? Good question. Um, we don't see much of that in, um, through Southeast Iowa. I, I don't know if we're just protected down here in this corner. Um, depending on the program and the rules, um, required of each program, it's a little bit different. I know the Iowa Finance Authority one with all the billions of dollars that it's attached to um, requires a valid state of Iowa ID. Um, if you don't have a valid state of ID in Iowa, I think there's still ways around it. So I think you could have an ID from somewhere in the 50 states, but you have to have a piece of mail or something that shows your, that matches your application residence. So I think the IFA program might be the best way around that. Um, I can use local dollars, not federal dollars for immigrant status um, assistance. I know there is there are agencies in our area, in our trade area that have immigration dollars to use, but the easiest and the least amount of red tape is usually partnering with other churches and using those local dollars is usually the best way. The CARES Act is probably there's a supplemental pot of money that we have access to right now that I'd have to look at the rules of that, but I haven't been presented anything yet that would qualify or that would make me ask questions about that part yet, but we don't see it much and we have been able to help. We haven't had to turn anybody away yet. Our Louisa County area probably has the most um, potential for that. And I haven't had any issues. We've been able to assist when needed with those programs. Uh -huh. It would seem that water is the most basic of needs and a health issue. Do you think there could ever be legislation that would make water a free necessary item like roads and parks and other things that we see as necessary? I think that I agree. I mean, I, I grew up in rural Lee County with a well and other than my parents putting the cost of digging the well and having the pump create the water for us. Um, you know, I live in farm country and didn't seem to hurt me any. So I think that there's ways to get water in those areas. But, you know, the Rathbun, I have Rathbun Regional Water at my current home, a home I've lived in for 30 years, um, that, you know, Rathbun Regional Water is not going to want to give their water away. They, they pipe water from the city of Fort Madison to my house 12 miles north. Um, and I pay $50 a month for that. How silly is that? 
when I have a well in my front yard. <laughs> but um, I can't see, because it's a business now, I can't see that it's ever going to be free again unless there's some government mandate that comes through. But I just can't see that happening yet. Um, let's see, do we let's see? I'm, I can't, if you want to unmute, I'm not, I can read your question as is. It says any information about American Rescue Plan Act money coming to you by way of the state and then in turn County Board of Supervisors. Okay, so you're asking is American Rescue Plan money coming to Community Action of Southeast Iowa either through the state or the county? It was just, I was not reading it. If it is, I have not been notified yet. Um, I think, I'm trying to think, I have a state phone call every morning at 9.30 for updates because things change by the minute right now. Um, so that I'm aware of, and that could be ARP. That could be a different acronym that I haven't wrapped my mind around yet, but to my knowledge, no. It doesn't mean it won't happen and we will welcome it. it, it it's just not one I'm familiar with yet. But I'm uh, gonna Google it now because I wanna know about it. <laughs> well, I know when I was speaking with um, Sherry Wilson, who I believe is director mm -hmm. of Media Action of Southeast Iowa, one of, the, um, one of the frustrations she expressed to me was that there's huge concern over people who fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that um, uh, there's a concern of many um, who are listening today that um, people who may not have uh, current citizenship, that may be an issue for them. And I know that Sherry, kind of like you, really stressed that those partnerships with local um, churches, local businesses, and just individuals who are able to provide funds that they don't target um, that's really, really helpful for your, for agencies like yours and others throughout the state. Sherry is my boss. So Sherry hired me, um, to work at the agency and she is an attorney by trade, but has worked in the nonprofit world her whole career. One of the most brilliant minds and giving hearts of anybody I've ever worked with and worked for. Um, I would not survive in this environment without her guidance and her leadership. And I say that it sounds so cheesy and so silly, but it is such, she is such a blessing to this agency and her mind and the way she works. I'm a business person and I think business. If you earn $20, you can only spend 10 because you have to use the other 10 to keep the business going. And she, she's just got it together. She balances me and makes sure that I uh, follow the, follow the rules to the best of their ability because it's just a different world for me. And I don't, I don't, I've never operated in this in this nonprofit world before, and it's one of the things I want to say quickly about the um, the partnerships. We are lucky enough to get funds from a lot of very generous hearts, and sometimes when we get those those dollars, they just say, "We trust you. Use it to the best of your ability." That's great, but we have the ability to track every penny that you there or somebody would give us. We have the ability to track and give a report every month. Um, there is a group of churches in Keokuk, Iowa, that must have people knocking on their doors every day for help. So this group of churches has pulled together um, donations, and they give us, as this group, uh, write us a check every month to help with very specific things. They want, you know, rent utilities, but they have very specific guidelines so that they can um, still do the mission work that they set out to do, but they don't actually have to sit and meet with every one of those clients and, and spend all that time. And I send a monthly report showing, I don't, I don't give any clients names. I don't give any, it's just demographic information because I want to prove to them that we are a good recipient of their funds and that we are using it to make an impact in their community every day. And that this is the work that they are putting that forward to. So it doesn't matter to me if the funds that we receive locally are tracked or not. In fact, I prefer that they're tracked because I want to prove that when I go out and talk to people that everything that we're doing is um, exactly as the, as the donor wishes and that as the, their mission and their, their goals are being fulfilled. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this opportunity to kind of shift us a little bit over to um, Linda Molyneux, because you just 
when, with what you were saying, Lisa, you reminded me when you said somebody who's been a lawyer and brilliant mind, very giving heart, that's also a description of Linda. Um, and so Linda, I was gonna ask if you would um, give us a brief um, uh, kind of background on you. And then if you would also um, tell us about the work that you are engaged in right now with regards to um, evictions and, and the hope of maybe even preventing some evictions. And I'm looking for you in my list, Linda. I don't know if you can unmute yourself, but I haven't found you in my list yet. I'm, I'm unmuted, so. Oh, here you are. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for those nice words. I am a 40 year member of St. Paul the Apostle Catholic Church Parish in Davenport. And while I was there, many things that I've done, I've been on the leadership for the parish, including the Service and Justice Commission and currently on the Social Justice um, Committee at the parish. I've been retired at, uh, for two years and I've been volunteering with the diocese for uh, about that period of time to uh, meet with the diocesan social action group on a now a, a weekly basis. Uh, two parts of my career that are sort of relevant to what I wanna talk about today is for 11 years while our children were young, I was a part-time judicial magistrate, which means that I was a judge in small claims court and things like that. But I also was someone who actually signed those orders evicting people. So I've I've been in that chair and I've, I've done that work. For the last 25 years, I was a legal services attorney. And while my primary focus was representing survivors of domestic violence in um, civil family law cases, every legal services attorney finds himself in eviction court trying to defend against eviction. So I've, I've got that perspective as well. Uh, I've only been involved with what we call silos to solutions for the last two months or so. but. Uh, one of the people who's been involved from the beginning at a meeting I went to recently gave a nice summary of the history of it. So I'm going to rely on Angie's summary and then get up to what I've been doing. Um, basically, this grew out of some community conversations when we were actually able in the Quad Cities to sit around real tables and talk to each other. And one of the things that was very clear from a short-term basis is we needed to do something to make sure that our winter overflow shelter was going to be viable but we didn't want that to be the, the only thing. We wanted to work out of that and not have the, the need for that anymore. And so there became a, a task force and a group studying to find out what can we do to get out of our silos, to get out of our individual ways of looking at things and look at long-term comprehensive uh, solutions to so that there's affordable housing and, and not just affordable housing, but but affordable housing that is well-maintained so that, that uh, someone isn't staying in something that they can afford, even though it's in, in very bad condition. So there were six goals that were set, and this was quite a, a long process, uh, studying what has been done in different parts of the country and things like that. There's one called production. How can we get new housing preservation? How can we make sure that the housing we have can be rehabbed and, and preserved, provision of services relating to housing, payment, you know, how do we pay for all this that we want to do our big plan and partnership, which of course is always key. You always have to collaborate. The part that I'm on is, is called prevention. And I must say they all start with the letter P and I would never have done that because I find that confusing. But prevention is the most clear cut to me and it seemed like the best fit for me because uh, Certainly, uh, and all my experience in eviction court was pre-COVID, but talk about housing instability. The average, not only average, the most common eviction in Iowa is for non-payment of rent. It starts by getting a three-day notice to cure or quit. And while the notices I don't think are very well written and they don't explain this to you, you do have the right to cure, which means to pay the full amount within the appropriate time and if you're able to do that, you're able to prevent um, an eviction from even being filed. Uh, I find that a totally unworkable system. Most people are not in a position to come up with the rent money that they weren't able to pay within a three day time period. Um, it's just, and oftentimes, of course, with the legal services clients, it's 
they were sick, so they uh, didn't work and they didn't have sick leave, so they weren't paid or their hours were cut or just something simple, something perhaps just short term. But when that uh, notice came, they weren't able to pay within the three days. So, so they get the notice and I'm not gonna go into all the technicalities of, of how they get it. And, but I must say that's, that's something that legal services attorneys do all the time. We try, to, we try to win on technicalities and you know, people don't like that, but we do, did everything we could to try to prevent the eviction. So they don't pay, they are, then the landlord can file the action. It's called a forcible entry and detainer action, which means that the court can order you to, to be required to, to move. You no longer have a right to be there. And if um, they follow the proper procedure, your, your property can be set out on the curb and they're not liable for any loss or damage to it. So in Scott County, what often happened is people would be served with those papers on a Friday. They would have an eviction hearing on Tuesday afternoon. So we're tearing our hair out because we're not probably going to be able to talk with the clients typically until Monday. And what we're doing is trying to figure out, are there any defenses? What, what can we help with? But what happens for the vast majority of people who are facing that kind of eviction, there aren't any defenses. They show up on Tuesday and they are given until the end of that week or the beginning of next to move. And totally unmanageable, totally uh, um, destabilizing an entire family, just a, a horrific experience. And that, of course, that's just before, before COVID. And the moratoriums have certainly been lifesavers, but it doesn't mean that there haven't been court hearings. And uh, some of the landlords are really pushing back in terms of the moratorium that relate to CDC about uh, whether in fact they, they do qualify. And, and so there've been hearings on, on those, those facts. So it's just not uh, even with, with those in place and, and they're being challenged and threatened all around, even with those in place, it doesn't mean that there's a guarantee of, of uh, housing stability. So what we've been doing in this prevention committee that I've been involved in for a couple months is we've been trying to form a, figure out how we can form a community alliance of tenants. The idea is that if tenants can, can get together, they can discuss common problems, they can share resources, they have a, can speak as a united voice, that that would be a very important resource for, for tenants. And at least in the Quad Cities, there's, there's, there are landlords associations and uh, this is something that is, we're working on the nuts and bolts of that right now. We're also, we have a very computer literate person in our committee who is looking at eviction data from both uh, Scott County, Iowa and Rock Island County, Illinois and trying to see are there, are there trends, are there things that we can learn about that. And, and Scott County has the distinction of having one of the highest eviction rates in the United States, which is appalling from my point of view as a legal services attorney. And that's where I was headquartered all these years. Um, we're, we're trying to obviously continue. We hope that we can defend against these evictions. My goal is ultimately to change the system because a three day time period and facing uh, having to move within a week after a hearing, just is totally unworkable. But there are two sort of models that we're, we're trying to work on. The, the most, um, Polk County has, still has in-person hearings in their, in their courthouse. And they actually have a help desk in the courthouse with money. They have, they're, have the ability to write a check then and come to arrangements with uh, landlords and they're able to prevent evictions that way. Uh, Scott County is still remote. We still don't have that capacity, but we're working toward trying to do something like that. So even though the eviction has been filed, we uh, hope that there's going to be a, a mechanism to, to, you know, settle the case on the courthouse steps kind of thing and, and prevent that eviction. But uh, Iowa was the first state to become fully uh, computerized electronic filing. On the one hand, uh, it's good to get all that information. On the other hand, to me, it's really frustrating that a landlord would look and see, oh yes, this potential tenant 
had an eviction action filed against them and they wouldn't look deeper to see that, but it was dismissed. And then they'll use that against them even though they didn't have to move, they weren't ordered to move. And an ultimate longer goal for the, this prevention of eviction uh, subcommittee is to have a mediation program so that if there are problems or disputes between landlord tenant uh, people with maybe a, the tenant says the landlord isn't making necessary repairs. Maybe the landlord said they're tired of just getting the rent in bits and pieces and nickels and dimes. They, they can have a trained mediator who would help that. And the, the key thing is to prevent the eviction from, from even being filed. And we don't currently have a, a system in our state to expunge evictions, but that's something else I wish could happen because for example, some of my domestic violence clients uh, weren't able to pay their rent because their abuser stole the rent money. And then oftentimes they wouldn't go to court. There was an eviction against them, but surely that's not something that, that um, we wouldn't want to be held against them um, in the same way that somebody who just simply had the money, didn't pay and, and was evicted would be treated and would be assessed by a prospective landlord. So that's sort of a, a summary of a really complicated, uh, very, very frustrating uh, system to, to work in. And, and as a magistrate, I never wanted to evict people, but you know, eviction for non-payment of rent is one of the most straightforward. Look at the, the details of it. If the details are there and they didn't pay, they're gonna be ordered to move. There we go. Thank you, Linda. Um, I know that the, this, uh, this is work that is, um, you're very, very, it's obvious, very passionate about. And I, I think uh, it's, it's good to know that somebody who feels as strongly as you do with the expertise that you have is there to try to um, improve conditions for people. Um, I had one comment um, that there are some social service agencies that require an eviction notice before the agency can provide financial assistance for a renter. So catch 22 right there. Um, you kind of would hope that it wouldn't get to the point of, like Linda said, let's try and stop it before the eviction notice goes out. Um, Steve Barton, who is a deacon in the Diocese of Davenport, um, asked if he could maybe make a few comments. So Steve, if you wanted to hop on, um, I know that uh, maybe give a real quick background on you so people understand that you've got some experience in this area as well. Okay, well, thank you. And I'll, I'll keep my time short because I know we're running out of time here. Um, Deacon Steve Barton at uh, Holy Family Davenport. I work for Habitat for Humanity. Prior to that, I worked uh, executive director for Rebuilding Together Quad Cities. So I worked in... Uh, nonprofit uh, assistance for people, for homeowners in the Quad Cities, both Scott and Rock Island County for about six years now. And um, I just wanted to make a real quick comment to give kind of a, a broader uh, understanding of, of the stable housing, what we call the housing continuum that runs from homelessness all the way up through uh, home ownership. And so uh, everybody's familiar with uh, homelessness you know, the next step is shelters, uh, transitional housing, um, stable rental situations. And Linda's talked about the issues with that, with evictions, uh, and then all the issues uh, along with, uh, on those lines. And then ultimately, uh, hopefully moving people into home ownership because the, for moving people from poverty, out of poverty, particularly generational poverty, the, the best, the ultimate step is to build equity and home ownership that can be passed on to other generations. Um, so that's kind of the, the goal of this housing continuum and all the uh, agencies in the Quad Cities that work in housing are somewhere along that continuum, helping people move along to that point. And of course here at Habitat, our goal is to help people have their first, first home ownership and then also to help people stay in their homes to maintain that home ownership. Thank you, Steve. Um, I did have a, a question. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask them in a flip of an order. So um, Barb is wondering what, um, 
what is available for any landlords who might be struggling and, um, and what, are, what does that mean for them and their tenants? Um, I know that um, there are really large companies that have uh, rental units all over spread out. Um, but I also know that there are landlords who own one, two, three units locally, and this is a source of income for them and maybe their primary source of income. Is there any assistance available um, directly to landlords or is it kind of coming in through what's going to the renters? Lisa, so, yeah, we, um, one of the things that Community Action does is when clients apply for rental assistance, the payments always go directly to the landlord. So we get a copy of the lease to guarantee that the home is indeed owned by, and we check the, you know, the Beacon web, Schneider websites and check, make sure that we're paying the true homeowner. Um, we suffer a little bit from that issue right now is we have a couple of big apartment complexes here in West Burlington that we work with and partner with on a regular basis. And the ownership is in Texas, recently purchased this just before the COVID, their closing occurred. And they're not getting rent on any 87 units. They're not getting rent from anybody. So they're unable to pay their mortgage. So we know at some point the bank is going to repossess that unit or that apartment complex and we're going to be 87 more people without a place to live. So this IFA program does help in the sense that the tenant fills out the application, the landlord has to verify it. If all the pieces come together, the landlord should get the money in a big chunk to, to help with that. I just don't know how long it's going to take. With the old program, once the application was proved, approved within 48 hours, the landlord received the money not sure how slick this one's going to be because we're in such a bottleneck right now, but hopefully it will work like that as well to save some of those landlords. My tenants aren't paying me right now. I understand. I have mortgage on one of those houses and it's an issue. I, luckily, we've been able to make it work so far, but there's not unlimited resources right here to make that continue to happen. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, you have to look at it from all sides. I know. Um, Linda, there was a question about, uh, could you possibly describe in more detail what Polk County does? That you were well, talking about? Basically all I know about what Polk County does is what I've read in the Des Moines Register. But uh, as I said, they're, they're physically in the courthouse. They have a, a table and they bring the landlord and tenant together. The landlord probably just wants rent. And, and of course their expenses to a landlord to, to evict a, a tenant and try to find someone new. But, but the key thing is that, that there, someone there has a checkbook and is able to write a check right then. And that's been the big frustration in general about de dealing with agencies. As someone's commented, a, a lot of times they require that, that eviction notice, but they're not geared up to be able to, to pay the money within the three day cure period. So so it's up to the landlord usually to decide whether they accept that agency involvement. And if so, that means they would agree to wait however long it takes the agency to, to process the check. But, but at least at, at one of the big innovations there in Polk County is that they have the money right away. So, so, so that's, that's important to settle the case. But technically speaking, by the time you're in eviction court, you no longer have a right to pay your rent. The only time you have a chance to cure the, the unpaid rent to pay it is within that three day time period after you've, you've gotten the notice. Okay. Okay. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, oh, Kent? I'm just gonna add, to you know, this particular conversation Lisa, as a member of the community at large, providing the services, and, and God bless the folks of Keokuk for working, the, the churches in that area, assisting with, because ultimately they may have said, we don't have the means of reviewing the requests. So we're going we're gonna to partner with an agency that knows how to do it well. That's a great approach. Ultimately, those churches know what the unmet needs are. I think the other part too I wanna share is if you are part of a parish group 
it's important to know what the lived experience is like for those living and working in poverty in your communities. And don't be overwhelmed by the complexity of it. Um, the, the Lindas and the Deacon Steves, who are part of our parish communities and have some additional insight, can be helpful to us as we're trying to figure out what the lived experience is, is different in, in Burlington or Keokuk as it would be Muscatine or Davenport. But we are called by our faith to understand what the lived experience is like for those that find themselves um, on the brink of not having um, shelter and, and being okay with being uncomfortable while we search for ways that we can be helpful and supportive so that they can provide stability to their families and their children within our communities. Um, I know Linda mentioned um, that Davenport is, has a really high eviction rate. And I think sometimes we tend to um, think things occur elsewhere. Um, the eviction lab, um, their 2016 data, they, they, when they looked at large cities, which large cities are 100,000 and over, Davenport was ranked 44th in the nation, Cedar Rapids was 89th, and Des Moines was 91st. For medium-sized cities, Waterloo came in at 87. So obviously within our state, we are seeing this problem. Um, I also wanted to point out that it's not just um, renters having problems. Um, I believe recent data says that right now there are about 3 million homeowners who are behind on their mortgages. Um, so um, we talked a lot about evictions and, and I think we tend to think renters, um, we, Foreclosures are a big, big issue also. Um, and COVID has taken that problem and blown it up also. Um, well, I wanna, I wanna thank everybody for being here today. We've got about two minutes left, but Lisa, thank you for joining us and sharing your expertise. Thank you so much for the work that you do on a daily basis and um, working your way through all of those government acronyms. We appreciate it. Um, and Linda, thank you again for um, retiring <laughs> only to do more work and to jump into something and, and to put your heart into it. Appreciate that. Um, our next Lunch and Learn is June 3rd, I believe is the first Thursday. Um, I think it's gonna be one that a lot of people will get a lot out of. We're going to hear from Iowa Winds, um, a kind of a grassroots organization um, out of Mount Pleasant um, they have been greatly involved with um, uh, immigrants in the area, and they were in existence before the, the um, ice raid that occurred there three years ago, but when that ice raid occurred and there was this sudden great need for these families that were impacted and in the community, they really stepped up their game. So we're going to kind of hear how their, their uh, growth occurred and what they're doing now. Um, so thanks very much, everybody. I hope to see you, uh, June 3rd. So have a great, uh, have a great Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to everybody.